Welcome to Primal Impulse's Primal Play 101 class, version 1.5. I've added some cool stuff to this, so this should be relatively interesting. What is Primal Play? Primal in the BDSM world is when someone enjoys taking on an animal-like characteristic or characteristics during sexual activity or power exchange. For, in other words, it's all about connecting with one's most primitive, basic, and animalistic selves. And it's centered around raw feelings, actions, and natural impulses. Even though it commonly takes on animal characteristics, you don't need to an identify nor pull from an animal to be primal, hence devil, hence other things. We'll go over different types of primals in a little bit, and then we can call on people to actually say other ones that they think that, that work for this. Primal is what many of us call animalistic and can be characterized by intense sexual experiences. This kink is not exclusive to any gender or sexual orientation, and thus anyone can identify as being a primal. You can also be a primal and not have sex, just like just like the rest of the kinks that we cover in these classes. These are some things that that people can either have sex or not, and you can feel completely comfortable with that. Those who enjoy primal play may describe it as a very passionate or sensual experience, as well as exhilarating. Primals release themselves from the inhibitions of our world and allow themselves to a specific headspace that that is instinctual and reactive to their basal impulses, and desires. In a general BDSM sense, primals can identify as dominants or submissives, which may choose to use alternate terms such as hunter and prey. Although less common, primal couples can also include two dominant primals, both of whom will seek to dominate the other. It can also be two submissives who are getting comfort with each other as primals, denning up together. Anyone can participate in any role in primal play. It's not limited to gender or sexual orientation or power exchange type. In this way, you can also include mating rituals that, like those experienced by wolves or bears, but a dominant doesn't have to be the predator and the submissive doesn't have to be the prey all the time or at all. It can switch back and forth. There are often times when roles are switched, which not, may not seem like it fits into the traditional DS structure, but primal play lies somewhat separate, although people like me use primal in many aspects of their own DS structures. For example, I use primal to get into a really good headspace. I use primal throughout almost every aspect that I do in terms of power exchange minus DDLG. That is something I don't do, but that's because of the gen more gentler headspace that that requires, at least for me. For that reason, primal play is often described as rough, which means that unhindering trust and communication is imperative between partners. It is also important to note that being a primal is not the same as pet play. While most primal individuals do identify as certain animals, they tend to not use leashes or collars during these aspects. It is entirely up to the partner's who fill that role and who fills it. Types of primals. Certainly in power and primal play, there are various primal types, which are essential archetypes or personas that people can adopt and express during the play. I have been told that these personas actually help people sort of get into a role and sort of understand primal more for themselves. So here's some examples. The alpha, the dominant and assertive leader of the pack. Alphas are typically competent, or competent and confident, strong and aggressive, and may engage in behaviors such as growling, biting, and asserting their dominance over others. A beta is a follower or supporter of the alpha. Betas may help the alpha assert their dominance or provide backup during conflicts with other players. The omega, the outcast or the rebel of the pack. Omegas may resist or challenge the authority to the alpha, or may simply choose to go on their own and act independently. Brats, I guess, <laughs> if you want to associate that a little bit. Or just people that have more of a free will spirit or switches that are sort of don't fit into either. Predator, a hunter or aggressor that seeks to dominate and overpower their prey. Predators may use physical force or intimidation or psychological manipulation to gain the upper hand. Prey, the submissive and vulnerable member of the pack. Prey are often smaller or weaker than the other players and may be chased, hunted, or pinned down by alphas or other predators. These are some a few of examples of primal primals that can be explored in primal play. It's worth noting that these types are not rigid categories and people may adopt different roles or blend the multiple archetypes during play. So here comes the fun part. Let's see where we identify. In primal play, there are various types of predators. So here's some examples. A wolf, the classic predator archetype, which is personally me. I know I'm in a, in a devil, but I do identify as a wolf type in my primal aspects. 
The wolf is known to be fierce and cunning, hunt, is known for its fierce cunning and hunting tactics. Wolves may work together in packs to take down larger prey, or they may act independently, relying on their sharp teeth and keen sense of smell to track down targets. The panther, a sleek and agile predator. The panther is known for its speed and grace. Panthers may pounce on their prey from a hidden perch or may use their sharp claws and teeth to overpower their targets in close combat. The snake, some people have seen my snake avatar, a stealthy and cunning predator. The snake is known for its ability to strike quickly and silently. Snakes may use their powerful coils to constrict their prey or may inject venom with their large fangs to inca incapacitate their victims. Again, in an RP sense, that's true. If you're doing IRL, it's highly recommend that you RP that as well. Don't actually inject anything in, into other people, please. The hawk, a predatory bird. Someone mentioned before, I think it was Dapple, that there was a hawk-like behavior happening at our last meetup here. Someone jumped from the top and just pounced them. That may have been me, actually. <laughs> so they're a predatory bird. The hawk is known for its sharp eyesight and powerful talons. Hawks may swoop down from the sky to catch their prey or may circle overhead waiting for the right moment to strike. And here's a nice one, and I apologize for the arachnophobics here, but a spider, a sneaky and patient predator, the spider is known for its ability to spin webs and ensnare its prey. It could be verbal webs too. Spiders may lie in wait for hours waiting for the unsuspecting victim to stumble into their trap or may hunt actively stalking their prey with slow and deliberate movements. Does anyone want to raise their hand or write in chat any other different types of predators that they think of outside of devil, which is a manipulative and aggressive predator? No. Okay, cool. Types of prey. A rabbit, a small type, a small and fast moving prey who relies on quick reflexes and evasive maneuvers to avoid capture. Rabbits may be jittery or easily frightened and they may squeal or whimper when they're caught. Yummy, yummy prey. Okay. Deer, a graceful and agile prey who moves with elegance and speed. Deer may use their long legs and powerful muscles to outrun predators or may freeze and blend in with their surroundings to avoid detection. A mouse, a timid and fragile prey who's easily overwhelmed by large, larger predators. Mice may rely on hiding or playing dead to avoid capture or may often find themselves willingly sacrificing themselves up to the alpha. A bird, a quick and nimble prey who takes to the air to escape ground-based predators. Birds may use their wings to fly away from danger or may perch higher in the trees to watch and wait for their next opportunity to escape. A cat, a playful and flirtatious prey who teases and taunts their predators before ultimately succumbing to their advances. Cats may use their sharp claws or teeth to defend themselves or they may simply enjoy the thrill of the chase and attention of their admirers. Those are fun. Those are fun little archetypes that you can bring into your normal play sessions and sort of experiment with what, think, what you think may work for you. The protection of the pack. In the animal kingdom, there, are, there is a sense of ultimate protection and belonging to a collective. Oftentimes, a group of animals form tribes, and within this dynamic, their primal instincts allow them to do whatever is necessary to get what they want, including when it comes to protecting their tribe. A BDSM primal pack is a group of people that either identify as wolves or act out those primal-like behaviors in their pack group. Again, you don't have to be a wolf, but a lot of people are. As with all kinks and fetish families, the primal pack family can function in a variety of different ways. Some primal packs will have a full-time scenario 24-7 where everyone lives together and the alpha runs the pack. Others may have pack members involved sexually with one another as well, or on a temporary basis. Thank you. This kind of behavior is a characteristic of those who identify as being primal and evidence suggests that being primal is oftentimes more prominent in the non-monogamous community. A lot of primals are non-monogamous because of the packed aspect, but that's not mutually exclusive. Okay. You see packs form via primal a lot of the time. This discord server even used to be my pack server, which centered on a primal power structure. Uh, you may have noticed that it's a lot of our structure in the server is based on house parts and different parts of houses. That's because it used to be a house server. And so we're leaving it there to sort of pay homage to that. But I just happen to think that that setup is funny. So you go into the parlor and you hang out with your friends, et cetera, et cetera. So primal headspaces. 
For myself, it's akin to splitting the awareness into two parts. One that all the one that is all of the desire and the need, the animal, the other, which I refer to as overwatch. Overwatch is the part that is always in control and almost slash listening from a third party perspective for safe word or signs that a partner is beyond the ability to give that or take away the consent. Because there are instances where people will just go nonverbal. For example, I was playing with somebody at a dungeon. I was using a flogger and a spanking on a spanking bench. They they could not say no because they just went nonverbal and just into a into a funny headspace. So that's where you use keys, for example. You can drop the keys and or the submissive can drop the keys and that would be a red, for example. So anyway, back to the quote. Overwatch is the part of you that never loses sight of the fact that you as a dominant are responsible for the well being of your partner. You might consider exploring meditation as a way to learn the split awareness between the two that just floats in sensation and the, and the other that listens to the signal to step out of the state. Also for me, providing aftercare to the partner is very important to the process and putting the primal aspect back in the box and coming back into oneself on both sides. So I'm gonna step in here and say, that's very important. A lot of people think that aftercare is just for submissives. That is not true. There was a case once when I was playing with a play partner of mine in a public dungeon and then the person that they were seeing romantically, they went to cuddle with them instead of me. And I felt like it was uh, something was wrong. I felt like I missed out on an experience and I needed to come down too. So I had to get help from someone else and that was bad form. So I had to have a conversation with that person afterwards and say, Hey, afterwards, we need to make sure that we're having aftercare together because dominance also need to come down. But no matter the approach, you find what works for you, take your time exploring and enjoy the journey. This is, also the ca this is also the case of prey who should be monitoring uh, if their headspaces are getting too intense and need to use a safe word to get out, right? Because I've seen in these classes at the previous location that some people just get really worked up and that's cool, but you need to make sure that you're not getting so worked up that you can't say no and you can't get out of it. So we'll go over primal senses next. Because being primitive means using one's most carnal and basic instincts, this kink is often centered around the senses. It involves intense listening and heightened sense, which can transcend a connection between two partners. It can also include scenes of fighting, powerful intimacy, and tapping into one's most carnal sexual desires. This kind of play is oftentimes more so about the experience rather than the lack or the act of sex. It involves trust, self-expression, and a sense of freedom that is hard to find anywhere else. A big reason why primal play is so popular is because it allows individuals to free themselves from societal constraints. And by reverting to a more natural and basic version, primal individuals can experience a sense of intense freedom, arousal, and intimacy. Our everyday lives are calculated and centered around abiding laws and societal norms, but being a primal and practicing primal play is a way to go back to the basics. It's a primitive experience where one can satisfy their lust by fighting or taking what they want or desire or running from that desire. It, this can be soothing and freeing for many as it can be a way to escape roles and responsibilities that everyday life brings. Example, I had a therapist who I, because of insurance reasons, I'm no longer with them, who told me in order to get over my need to be controlling in a lot of aspects of my life, hence I'm a dominant, I should go into primal at least once a day to be more in the moment. So it's being used therapeutically in that way. We'll go into primal behaviors, sniffing, growling, scratching, wrestling, biting, vocalizing. It's all about using your five senses and tapping into one's basic instincts. Following one's partner's scent can be important, such as the smell of their sweat. A lot of people that are in this can, can tell you that their sense of smell does get larger and better because they're focusing so much on it. A fight for dominance, just like in the animal kingdom, Two animals may fight in order to gain dominance. During primal play, power is exchanged. Chasing. It could involve chasing or being chased around the home or space in order to hunt one's prey. Hence our primal event tonight and the hunt. Forced submission, again, edge play and CNC. Once a partner has been overpowered, the two may continue to struggle until forced submission occurs. It is important to understand, or. It's a common misunderstanding of primal play is the assumption that it always involves growling or is the same way as animal role play. Some kinksters who, who engage in primal play, AKA primals, will growl or take on the more animal characteristics, 
but is not a requirement or a defining aspect of all primals. Such an aspect of this kink are viewed as organic, natural arising demonstrations of raw emotion and involvement in a scene. So if growling is not something you do, that's perfectly okay. You move on to other things that could, uh, could better uh, express yourself. I'm going to give a disclaimer here. Because of what we've heard today, communication, trust, safety is vital in this kind of play. And as such, it's classified as edge play. It is inherently dangerous and should be done with your partner's safety in mind as a number one priority. So we'll go over some safety practices so you can make sure that you're staying safe. Engaging in primal play needs to involve unwavering trust, respect, and communication between partners. And while we know that this, is, this kind of scene involves animalistic, un, uninhibited, and impulsive behavior, it does not mean that things are not discussed and agreed upon beforehand. And it does not give that as a reason or justification for breaking someone's consent or going past what you discussed. Just like a dominant and submissive who discusses their likes, dislikes, limits, and hard limits with each other, a primal and their partner too should have an open dialogue to establish their scenes. For both partners or more multiples for packs, it's about diving into the wild sexual play, yes, but it's also about feeling safe, comfortable, and ultimately satisfied. Safe words are required for this type of play. Anyone who says otherwise, get rid of them. After primal play, aftercare is just as important, whereby partners comfort each other and have open communication about the scene and make sure that both feel seen and appreciated rather than discarded and used. Aftercare is, very simply, the time you and your partner take to after playtime to recover and also to see to each other's emotional and physical needs. Primal is more physically and emotionally exhausting. So this is the time of a, this, so this time is a great time for relaxing as well as getting back to reality. How we are treated by our partners or how we treat our partners during primal play may not necessarily correlate with who we are in our regular everyday lives. Aftercare functions as a recalibration for normalcy in your relationship. Aftercare can generally put into two categories, physically and or physical and emotional. Physical aftercare includes such things as helping to remove any paraphernalia like restraints or blindfolds, getting your partner something to eat or drink, blood sugar levels are important to pay attention to, and or if someone may be thirsty, most of the time you do give water afterwards, it's very important, everyone hydrate, providing a blanket or warm clothing, kissing or caressing any part of their body, or specific, or specific area that may have been marked during play, or providing affection and comfort in a, pli in a quiet place, usually away from the scene so that the, it's disconnected. So you're disconnecting the mind from it, right? So what is the conclusion here? We have five tips slash conclusions that we can take from this. Number one, communication is, as with any type of BDSM play, clear communication and negotiation are essential and required for primal play. Before beginning any scene, it's important to discuss boundaries, limits, etc., and safe words to ensure that everyone is on the same page. Safety first. Number two, primal play can involve physical content and intense emotions, so it's important to take the appropriate safety precautions. This may include using safe words and et cetera, et cetera, but it's, you know, as with communication, you want to be safe. Mindset matters. Primal play, this is number three. Primal play is all about exploring primal instincts and emotions, so it's important to approach the play in a mindset of openness and vulnerability. This can help you fully embrace your role and get the most out of your experience. Number four, it is not for everyone. Primal play can be intense and emotionally challenging, and it's not for everyone. If you're considering exploring this type of play, it's important to be honest with yourself and your partner about your desires, interests, or boundaries. Again, everything that we teach here, it's not gonna be for everybody. We saw last week during our DDLG class that we had a very low turnout, and that's okay, because DDLG isn't for everybody. There's a stigma attached to it, and I highly recommend you actually go back and watch that VOD, because you can sort of, if you're, if you're sort of turned off by the fact, that's okay. But I do explain why there's a stigma and try to educate more on that topic. So I, I do recommend that. So, and number five, have fun. Primal play can be thrilling and exciting and a way to explore your primal side and connect with your partners. As long as you approach the play with a spirit of openness and respect, you will have a great time and create memorable experiences. These hunts are a good example of that. A lot of people here are coming to their third, fourth, fifth hunt because we enjoy this kind of aspect and bonding with each other and learning about ourselves.